In this video, we'll discuss some of the challenges of applying standard optimization techniques to neural networks, such as the non-convexity of neural networks and their high dimensionality. Let's dive right in. Challenges in the optimization of neural networks. In the optimization of neural networks, we have the following basic problem of finding the minimizer of this loss function here with respect to the model parameters theta. Now I should note that we're actually changing notation from our previous optimization videos because there, as in the pure optimization literature, we use the nomenclature to minimize f of x. However, in the deep learning literature, x, in this case, x superscript i, is the ith data point. And here we are optimizing with respect to the weights theta. So we have an f of theta and we're optimizing with respect to that. Now, why is this optimization of neural networks hard? Well, first of all, there is a lot of non-convexity. So the model that we are fitting is a highly non-convex function of the parameters. Secondly, our data sets are large, so we have a lot of data points. So little n is large, and the problem is very high dimensional. In state of the art neural architectures, they're very wide and very deep, so this dimensionality d is very large. And then finally, the structure of the neural network can actually yield a very hard to optimize response surface. And these are the challenges that we're going to look at in this video. So firstly, with respect to non-convexity. So if we actually have a non-convex function, f of theta, then, well, actually, the Hessian is not necessarily going to be positive definite. And, well, if the Hessian is not positive definite, then the, in so the inverse might not even exist. And even if the inverse is defined, then this precondition gradient step here might still actually not even be a descent direction. So even if you go an infinitesimally small step in this direction, we might actually increase our loss function rather than minimizing or reducing it. So therefore, using the Hessian for non-convex problems is not necessarily a good idea. You could think about applying the Hessian locally around a minimum, because maybe then you actually have some local convexity, but globally, it's problematic to apply it because well, we have non-convexity in the neural network. So one reason for this non-convexity of the loss function of neural networks is that we have local minima in the weight space. These local minima are partly caused by symmetry in the weight space. So think of taking two units in a layer and actually swapping their input and output weights around. And this would then actually yield exactly the same function being computed. And well, therefore, the model is not identifiable. And each minimum is going to have an exponential number of copies of weight vectors that yield exactly the same performance. And in between these, there's, of course, not necessarily always a path along which you have the same performance. So that's one cause of local minima. The existence of local minima appears to be a big problem at first glance. And indeed, for decades, people were actually quite worried about this problem of finding this global minimum in a space ridden with local minima. But in modern deep learning, it turns out that poor local minima actually are not really a big problem because they don't actually tend to be very frequent. So it's not the case that you have a lot of poor local minima. There is still a lot of local minima, but they actually all tend to be quite good. So one reason for this would be that in order to actually have a local optimum, you or a minimum, you can't have any directions in which the function decreases. And if you have more and more dimensions, then more and more of these directions have to be non-decreasing in order to get a local optimum, a local minimum. So if you have a local minimum, of a small neural network, for example, and then think about you just add extra units to each layer, and you're adding a lot of extra weights, and then there would actually be a good chance that for one of these new weights, there is an optimization direction or 
combination of these that would actually yield a decreasing direction. And when you take a step in that direction, then you could actually move to a different part of the weight space. And there you could also potentially then find decreasing directions again for the original dimensions. So adding extra units actually then got rid of a local minimum in this uh, small neural network. And since in modern deep learning, we actually have a lot of dimensions, and actually we typically heavily over-parameterize our networks, it appears to be the case that local optima are not as much of a problem as one would have thought before. Another problem related to non-convexity are saddle points. A saddle point is a point like this one, where all the derivatives are actually zero. So you have that all the derivatives at this point are zero. But the point is actually a minimizer with respect to some dimensions. But then it is also a maximizer with respect to other dimensions. And so while for a local minimum, all the eigenvalues of the Hessian are positive, for saddle points, some eigenvalues of the Hessian are positive and some are negative. And in high dimensions, where we are in neural network optimization, these saddle points actually are exponentially more likely than local minima. To see this, think about a model in which an extremum in a single dimension is a minimum with a probability of 0 0.5 and a maximum with a probability of 0 0.5. And then when you're drawing points uniformly at random that are extrema in all different dimensions, then the probability that each single one of these dimensions is a minimum is 0 0.5 to the power of d, where d is a dimensionality. So it's exponentially less likely to get a local minimum than it is to get some point that is a maximizer in some dimension and a minimizer in some dimension. Of course, this model is not perfect since our optimization actually favors points of low cost. We are we're going towards points that, that minimize the loss function. So we're visiting many more points of, at low cost and in those local minima, um, and in those points that the local minima are actually much more likely than 0 0.5 probability. But the fact remains that saddle points are extremely frequent in this whole space. They get less frequent as we're going to better regions of the space with lower loss, but they're still very common. Now, fortunately, they're actually not so bad for first order methods. So near the saddle points, the gradients are small, but empirically, this isn't so bad for um, first order methods because all well, these first order methods actually walk in the right direction. They walk away from the maximum. So, and when they walk away from the maximum, then actually the absolute gradients get larger again and they move away faster from the maximum. So they don't get stuck. However, for second order optimizers, these saddle points are actually a real problem because they're tractors for these second order methods. The second order methods look for points. They try to find points where all the gradients are zero and saddle points are actually solutions for these points, just like uh, points that are maximizers in all dimensions. And just like um, there are points that are minimizers in all dimensions, all of these have um, the property that all the gradients are zero and all of these are actually solutions for second order methods. So we saw before that for the simple u-shaped quadratic function that um, Newton's method actually hits the optimum in a single step, the minimum. But if you have an upside down u-shaped function, well then Newton's method would hit the maximizer in a single step. And also if we have lots of these saddle points in our space, and as we said, we have exponentially many, then, and, and if they're attractors to second order methods, then, well, they're a real problem for second order methods. So if and when 
we actually get to scale second order methods for deep learning, then we'll still have to worry a lot about these saddle points because all well, their attractors for the second order methods. I'd now like to give you a little bit more intuition why Newton's method as a prototypical second order method is actually attracted to local maxima just the same way it is attracted to local minima. So here is the update equation of Newton's method. And it's just like the update equation for gradient descent, except that we have the inverse Hessian here. So we have the gradient that's pre-multiplied by this preconditional matrix, which is the inverse Hessian. And if we actually have a point such as this here and this plot here that has a negative curvature, then the Hessian is going to be negative. And so while gradient descent would move down here, the um, Newton's method is going to move up there because, well, the, the gradient is going to be multiplied by something that's negative. And so if the Hessian is negative, then the inverse Hessian is also negative. And in particular, what Newton's method would do here is it would interpolate this or approximate this function from this local um, function evaluation and gradient to be this quadratic function and then just go directly to the point in this quadratic function where the gradient is zero. So it would move here, basically here, and then next it would move closer and closer and closer until it's actually at the local optimum. All right, so let's now move on to some issues that are caused by the large training data sets. So the obvious problem with respect to that is that, well, even computing the gradient of this function now contains n terms. And so even just compute, computing a single exact gradient is actually a very expensive operation. Similarly, uh, the Hessian also um, is, it, um, is computed through n different terms. And here it's not only n that is large, well, D is also large, D was also large before, but here it's particularly bad because, well, the Hessian is um, a matrix that is D by D, and so it, it is even too big to store in memory. So really computing the exact Hessian is something that we should just say goodbye to in deep learning optimization. But one could think of approximations and people are actually working on approximate second order methods that approximate the Hessian, for example, with a block diagonal matrix and so on, and, and just compute it based on mini batches. So there are some approaches that try to approximate um, these Hessians and, and still use them, um, the inverse thereof, as preconditioners. And in fact, adaptive gradient methods such as Adam can be seen as approximations of that. All right, let's now move to some problems caused by the structure of the network. And one problem caused by the structure of the network is nicely visualized by this figure here that shows this cliff-like structure where we have relatively small gradients here in this region, then we have a very steep gradient here, and then we have a very flat gradient again here. And these cliff-like structures can result from actually multiplying several weights together and are most common in recurrent neural networks, abbreviated RNNs, and we'll, we'll see RNNs in more detail in a future lecture. But well, for now, suffice it to say that they have a weight matrix in every layer in the simplest form that, it, that are being multiplied together. And so if we, and they, they therefore amplify the differences in, in the initial parts of the network. So if we have, relatively small weights, then this is amplified to a very small gradient. And if we have a bit larger weights, then this could actually already be simply um, amplified to this very steep gradient. And that can also lead to another issue that we'll see on the next slide that's called exploding gradients, where well, this, this um, problem is amplified with more depth in the network. Now these cliffs here 
Fortunately, the, the most serious consequences of these cliffs can be tackled with a mechanism called gradient clipping. That's a very simple heuristic that simply says, well, if my gradient gets too large in a certain direction, then I'm just going to clip it at a certain threshold. And it's motivated by the rationale that, well, the gradient only gives the right direction if you were to take an infinitesimally small step. And it doesn't justify making a very large step in that direction. And so to caution, we'll not go further than a fixed hyperparameter that says the magnitude at which we clip. All right, let's now get to this phenomenon of vanishing and exploding gradients that I already alluded to. And we'll be using an illustrative example here where we use a recurrent neural network, simple one, that multiplies its inputs by a weight matrix W in each step. And let's say that this W has the following singular value decomposition, where you have these orthonormal matrices V and its inverse, and then you have all the diagonal matrix of eigenvalues. And then if you repeatedly multiply by W t times, then this yields, well, W raised to the power of t is just this term raised to the power of t. And then because, well, V is an orthonormal matrix and you multiply it by its inverse, you get just the identity matrix when you um, multiply these terms of v to the minus 1 and v, then actually they cancel out. But the diagonal matrix of eigenvalues is just raised to the power of t. And then what that means is when you backpropagate through this, the gradients of your network will just also be scaled by the eigenvalues to the power of t. So if you have eigenvalues that are larger than 1, as t grows large, very large, then you actually have exploding gradients. And well, if you have something that's smaller than 1 to the power of an, a large number, you basically get 0. So in the latter case, with gradients that are basically 0, that's a case of vanishing gradients, you have numerical issues, and basically you multiply by zero and everything becomes zero and you stop moving in term, so the gradient becomes zero and you stop moving. And in the case of exploding gradients, well, your gradients basically become infinite and you make extremely large steps that will either lead to you getting NANs in your weights or you do gradients clipping pretty much at every step. And so both of these are actually um, extremely problematic. And so you actually want to change your network structure in order to avoid issues like that, in order to create a response surface that is actually easier to optimize with our typical optimizers in deep learning. So for example, you can use activation functions that guard against um, yeah, exploding gradients, such as the ReLU, which just has a constant gradient of 1 for values larger than 0. And um, you can also use recurrent network structures that are more advanced, like LSTMs, that were actually specifically designed in order to avoid this problem of vanishing and exploding gradients. So summarizing. You want to pick your network architecture in a way to make the optimization problem easier. All right, this brings us to the end of this video. And as always, I'd like to leave you with some questions. So I encourage you to pause the video here and think about them to activate the material. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.